So right now we're seeing a big trend in movies about the multiverse, with The Flash being the most recent to hop on the bandwagon and Marvel hyping up their newest phase of the multiverse saga. It feels like everybody and their mother is trying to get a slice of that extra dimensional pie. But not all of these movies are built the same. Sure, there have been some decent attempts at it, but overall it feels like just a passing trend. However, there are two that stick out above the rest as the ones that use the multiverse concept to the fullest. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse and Everything Everywhere All at Once. But why is that? Well, the answer is simple. It's all about the bagels. And you know what goes great with bagels? Honey, which is perfect timing because today's video is brought to you by PayPal Honey. Honey is the number one shopping tool in America. What it does is it basically adds a little button to the top of your browser, and whenever you're shopping online, Honey will automatically run through every discount or coupon code that I can think of to make sure you're saving the most possible. I've honestly been using Honey for years before they even reached out to me. You can use it for clothes, video game, tech. Hell, I used it for a cosplay once and it saved me like 50 bucks. Where there's a coupon available, Honey will save users an average of 18% per purchase. It works on sites you already use, it saves you money, and the best part about it, it's completely free. You don't need to pay a cent in subscriptions or fees or anything. This is a really hard thing to do an ad for because normally I'm like trying to sell you something, like I'm trying to explain why something's worth your money, but this is free. It's literally a free service that saves you money. Like it feels kind of obvious, but I feel like I don't have to say anything else. Like, it, it, like why not, you know? Now you could just go to joinhoney.com and sign up to add Honey to your browser that way, or you could go to joinhoney.com slash Troy Oboyo to maybe help support the channel a little bit. I don't know, maybe I'd, I don't know, maybe I'd appreciate it. It's free, and thanks so much again to PayPal Honey for sponsoring this video. Despite all of these multiverse movies coming out, despite the massive influx of the idea in basically all forms of media, the two most beloved also just so happen to be the two that feature a bagel? If you ask me, that's too weird to be a coincidence. Two movies that are critically acclaimed and commercial successes, both featuring phenomenal visuals and action using the multiverse concept as a framework and also having a bagel be a driving central force. There has to be something to that, right? There has to be some kind of connection, some kind of reason for it to mean something. So what's the deal with these bagels in multiverse movies? The multiverse as an idea has been in people's heads for thousands of years. It's not just a new creation by the MCU to put superhero cameos into their movies. It's a concept that's been debated in science and used in fiction and it is as classic as time travel or clones or other planets. So to really get to the root of this, we have to go back. In the 6th century BCE, oh wow, okay, I guess we went really far back, a Greek philosopher named Anaximander first proposed the idea that there might be infinite worlds. There's some debate as to what he meant by that, whether they were coexisting worlds or if they were successive, but he's generally credited as the first person to suggest the concept of a multiverse. Now you might be asking, Troy, what does this have to do with the bagels? Don't worry, I'm getting to that. In 1895, philosopher and psychologist William James was the first to coin the term multiverse, but it was in a totally different context. I'd be good to admit, I have no idea what he was talking about. I tried reading that book and it's all an old timey speak and I have no goddamn clue what he's saying. And the term as we understand it was first used in fiction in 1961 with issue number 123 of The Flash titled The Flash of Two Worlds, written by Gardner Fox and art by Carmine Infantino. See, now we're talking about superheroes. This video is technically on brand for me. It told the story of Barry Allen, the Silver Age Flash of Earth 1, who accidentally vibrated his way onto Earth 2, you know, I hate when that happens, where he discovers the original Flash of the Golden Age, Jay Garrick, who he thought was a fictional character, but in fact existed in a separate reality. After this issue, the multi first became a key element in DC Comics continuity. The book established the idea that there are different versions of the characters that can exist in parallel timelines, not only highlighting the legacy that superhero mantles can have across different dimensions, but also allowing for crossovers and interactions between the two eras and future stories. And boy, yo boy, did they. Ever since, the multiverse has been a staple not only in DC Comics, but in all of science fiction and pop culture, leading to the rise and borderline oversaturation of the concept in film over the past couple of years. Again, I promise I'm going to get to the bagels, just hear me out for a second. A lot of people have brought up the idea of multiverse fatigue, that there's a huge amount of oversaturation of the concept and it's burning people out on the idea. Unlike superhero fatigue, which I talked about in a separate video, the multiverse as a concept is pretty restricted to the science fiction genre, as opposed to other superhero stuff, which could be sci-fi or crime dramas or westerns or any other kind of story. However, this multiverse burnout is also a result of, well, Frankly, because a lot of the movies just aren't very good. Now, what's bad and good is like everything I always say in every single one of my videos, entirely subjective. But if you ask me, the absolute worst way to use the multiverse is when it's an obvious mouthpiece for a corporate agenda. Cheap fan service, glup shittos, a way for these massive conglomerates to show off all their IPs and things that they own to get crowd reactions instead of properly telling a story using the idea. There are movies where the word multiverse can be swapped out with whatever buzzword you want and the cameos can be just action figures turned to life and the fundamental story wouldn't change. And to me, there's there's no worse offender of this 
than the recent Flash movie. I know I just spent like 20 minutes ripping into this movie last week, but God damn it, I'm gonna do it again. Even if you enjoy the Flash movie, which I know that there are a lot of people that do, and I'm not trying to minimize that, you could easily cut out everything that has to do with the multiverse and the movie would be completely identical. Hell, if you really wanna get into the nitty gritty of it all, if you really wanna go down that route, I would say it's not even a multiverse movie. It's a time travel movie with a parallel timeline. There's a difference and it's driving me crazy. Nobody's saying that Back to the Future 2 is a multiverse movie, so why the fuck are we saying that the Flash is? There is a certain level of irony though in a Flash comic being the first ever story to use the multiverse in fiction and then 60 years later the first Flash movie tries to force it in because it's a trending topic. Here do you want me to put like a timer up a countdown to the bagels here will that make you happy there you go. The genre of science fiction at its core is fundamentally about metaphor and allegories. It's not just to watch silly space shit happen but to provide a social commentary about the current world we live in either a positive critique or a negative one usually a negative one because the world we live in is fucking awful and the multiverse concept is really no different. The stories that just slap it on with no real regard for how to use it or for what it might mean thematically are the ones where it fails. But the stories that use it properly, that take this massive concept of the multiverse and all that comes with it to try and apply some form of meaning and themes to it are the ones where it has a higher chance of succeeding. It might not make the movie perfect by any means, there's of course so much more that goes into making a film, but it's at least a start. Multiverse of Madness was messy, but at the very least that movie used the concept of the multiverse to force Strange to face his own deepest personal flaws. I also really like how it established that dreams and nightmares are a connection to the multiverse. That's like some kind of Neil Gaiman level stuff right there, it's really cool, I like that. But the thing I love the most about that movie, and while I'll defend it to my dying days even when everyone else seems to hate it, is how it subverted what people thought they wanted out of this kind of movie. So many people went into it expecting to see some big hype cameo fest, all their favorite actors coming back, their fan cast realized, even fucking Tom Cruise as Iron Man for some reason. Why, why did people want that? And the movie delivered on most of that, before it killed them all in a horrifically spectacular fashion. <laughs> Honestly, the worst parts of that movie for me are the parts where it's trying to hype these people up, when it's trying to be that crowd pleaser and set up the Marvel multiverse, but then it flipped that on its head and did something interesting with it, and that's why I dig it. And in spite of whatever other problems the movie has, because it definitely has a lot of them, I can at least enjoy it for that much, especially in this current climate of multiverse hype fest that we have. When you think about it, it's basically the reverse Flash. Remember when you were making out with your Wait, first Wait, no, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on! And so that's why I'm not really looking forward to Avengers Secret Wars and the rest of this multiverse saga, because I just no, it's gonna be more of the same stuff that I didn't like. But of course, there are two multiverse movies that do it better than any other. 2022's Everything Everywhere All at Once, directed by Daniel Kwan and Daniel Shiner, and the recent Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, directed by Joaquin Dos Santos, Kent Powers, and Justin K. Thompson. Everything Everywhere is quite possibly my favorite movie ever made period. I know it's not some crazy hot take to say that this movie's good and, and you know it might feel like it's some recency bias and it feels like everybody was so obsessed with it and that it was overhyped but I don't care. I have literally never had an emotional experience with the movie quite like I did with Everything Everywhere. What it had to say about life, family, love, kindness, and purpose truly touched me at my core and I didn't even know I was capable of feeling the emotions that this movie made me feel. But most importantly the movie uses the multiverse concept as a commentary for the feeling of overwhelm that we we experience in modern life. Even from the opening scenes, we see everyone is dealing with an influx of information. Evelyn is focused on trying to run the laundromat while also preparing for her father to arrive, while also having a conversation with her daughter Joy about her girlfriend, all the while her husband Wayman is trying to have the difficult conversation of wanting a divorce. Even Jenny Slate's character is having multiple conversations at once, existing in two different universes at the same time. It honestly feels like a metaphor for technology and the internet and social media and the ability to have infinite information at your fingertips, and all that information being thrown at you at the same time, whether it's algorithms or timelines or advertisements or whatever, it's enough to make anyone overwhelmed. And the movie says that it's okay to feel that way. There's nothing wrong with that. You just have to focus on the things that matter. And compare that to how Spider-Verse did it. The first movie was incredible, it's still one of my favorite movies ever, but the Spider-Verse was barely touched upon and was mainly just a way for these different spider people to be present in the story. As opposed to the sequel, Across the Spider-Verse, which made a meta commentary on the Spider-Man character, a look at toxic fandoms, as well as an overall message regarding conditional allyship. I have a whole video on that one. And I think it's pretty good. It uses the canon as a representation for the status quo. Sets of multiversal rules that are set upon the character and the rest of the spider people, and the major theme of the movie is for Miles to go against that status quo and break those rules to do his own thing. But there is, of course, one thing that links these movies together. It's time for the moment you've been waiting for. Da, 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 da. Da 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 da
The bagels. But first, what is a bagel? The bagel originates from the Jewish communities of Poland. It's made by shaping dough into a ring shape before, oh my god, okay, fine, I'll get on with it. Across the Spider-Verse's main villain, The Spot, cites his origin beginning when Spider-Man hit him in the head with a bagel in the previous movie. And now he's threatening to destroy the multiverse in an attempt to seek his revenge. And everything everywhere had the bagel a little more front and center with Joy putting everything onto a bagel. I mean everything. Causing that to collapse in on itself and risk destroying the multiverse. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? Now, there are a ton of different ways that you could read into this. I think it's pretty notable that the Spot, a character whose main trait is having his body covered in holes, was hit in the head with a food that's most famously known for having a big hole in it. Maybe it's a representation of the hole that was left in him emotionally because of the trauma of his accident and the way that society treated him. There's also a theory from the 2009 book The Bagel, The Surprising History of a Modest Bread by Maria Bolinska about the origin of the bagel. The idea is that in the late 1200s in Poland, Polish bishops decreed that Jewish people were banned from baking and selling bread to Christians. And so in an attempt to get around this bigotry and still be able to survive, Jewish bakers found a loophole. Loop? Hole? And so they first boiled their dough before baking it, which is what leads to the bagel's chewy interior with a crispy exterior. Not only finding a way around the bigoted rules, but also to assure their customers that their poisons and Jewish magic had been cleaned away or whatever. Anti-Semites are really fucking stupid. I obviously can't confirm any of this because... I wasn't there. But Spider-Verse, a movie that's fundamentally anti-authoritarian and about breaking the rules, there's no way that's a coincidence, right? Everything Everywhere has themes about not closing yourself off from your family and expressing that love. Maybe the hard crust and soft center of a bagel is a metaphor for that. But I think we can even think a bit bigger. The multiverse is a huge cosmic idea. And so when you look at other celestial bodies, you notice some similarities. The rings of Saturn, bagel. The orbits of the planets, bagels. The spiral of the Milky Way galaxy, bagel. Black holes, just a big bagel. Maybe the bagel is a visual for these grand, massive ideas, a way to shrink them down to something as simple as a household object that we can all understand. So what's the connection? What's the deal with all these bagels? There's so many different possibilities and representations that the bagel could have, so what's the right answer? And basically what I'm trying to say is, I have no fucking idea. All right, realistically, Into the Spider-Verse came out in 2018, where a character got hit in the head with a funny food item. That joke got expanded upon and turned into the backstory of the main villain five years later. A villain, mind you, that they weren't even planning on including. And at the same time, the Daniels made their own movie with their own commentary and depiction of the multiverse, using an overloaded bagel for a visual of how overwhelming the world is. Spider-Verse even included a little Easter egg reference to everything everywhere on top of Sparks' apartment as a nod to that. There was no conspiracy, no connection, no hidden meaning, no secret link for someone to make content out of, just a random case of parallel thinking and just a funny coincidence between two otherwise unrelated fantastic movies. I think we all try to find patterns, connections, links to explain things that otherwise are just coincidences. It's something that the human brain is really good at. It's why we see faces in things where there aren't any. Sometimes those patterns are real and there's something to it, and other times there's not. Because I'm gonna admit, I came up with the idea for this video long before I had anything to say. I thought of the title, I made the thumbnail, and for weeks I tried to rack my brain to find some meaningful way to connect these two movies. Some way for these two pieces of art, some of my favorite films ever made, to have some connection that's more than just a surface level bread roll. Some definitive right answer, and I just couldn't. I recently watched the new Wes Anderson movie, Asteroid City, and I absolutely loved it. It's one of my favorites of his, and I won't spoil it or anything for those who haven't seen it, but a main theme of that movie, or at least one of the readings that I got, has to do with purpose. It's set during the 1950s, a period where the world started to become a lot more complicated. People were living with undiagnosed PTSD and were struggling to find their place in everything. All of the characters in the movie are trying to find meaning in something, something to justify their existence, and the movie basically just says, whatever. Whatever you think is right, that's right. Whatever matters to you, whatever you love, whatever brings you joy, that's your purpose. And whatever you're doing, just keep on doing it. I'm grossly oversimplifying this movie. Uh, of course, there's so much more to it. It's part of why I liked it so much. But it's a message that I really resonated with because that's the best thing about art. I talk a lot about subjectivity versus objectivity. And the beauty of that subjectivity is that any and all reading of a work is entirely valid. The term death of the author has been thrown around a lot lately, namely to defend supporting the product of terrible people. But the original meaning of that phrase means simply to view art regardless of authorial intent. To see things through your own perspective and not try to figure out what the author meant by it. There's a whole thing in 
literature discourse about formalism and the curtains were blue. One reading of the story could say that the curtains were blue to symbolize the character's inner turmoil or the society that existed around the author when it was written. Or maybe the curtains were just blue. But regardless, either reading is valid no matter what the intent behind it was. It's important to try to analyze symbolism and metaphor in art and writing, to try and read between the lines and see stories and themes that might be hidden below the surface. Like I said, it's a massive part of science fiction as a genre and it's an integral part of media literacy that I worry too many people have forgotten about. But good art will always allow for that and inspire that. Inspire people to approach it with new angles or find meaning regardless of if it was intentional or not. Whether that's about superheroes, the multiverse, or a bagel. Maybe to you, it's a representation of our place in the wide universe, or the hole that's left inside of us from our own personal trauma, or a reference to Jewish history of standing up to their oppressors, or a metaphor for capitalism. Or maybe it's just a bagel. Special thanks to 21 Escalators, Alto the Sting, Anz, Already Done It, Cabbage Boy, Cassidy, Chicken McDoofus, Cosmic Tragedy, Dan the Dreamer Show, Deco.py, DJ Ricky 08, Eden Kenna, Iron Ninja, Jake Selig, Jonah, Corey's Not Fresh, Lime Spice XL, Logan Triple Films, Simply Dan, Spectacular Clyde, Tim Newfeld, Choices by Erasure's Lame, Tyler Goodrich, Josh Kapoor, Zachary Stonebreaker, and Zero to Hero 148 for being spectacular fanboys on my Patreon. This has been Troy Boy 17 coming at you live. Be responsible, and I will see you around.